Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. Welcome to the 44th Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology in Malaysia. My name is Nick Rumzi and I'm the head of uh, Power Electronics and Drive Research Group uh, at School of Electrical Engineering, UTM. Today we are very fortunate to have our guest speaker streaming live from the United States, Professor Iqbal Hussein from the North Carolina State University. Uh, today, Prof. Uh, Hussein will talk about his research work on high-speed electric machines and why band gap power electronics for electric transportation systems. Prof. Hussein is not new to our research group. I met uh, Prof. Uh, Hussein when I was attached to the University of Akron in Ohio a long, long time ago, and uh, I think several years later, I think uh, it is in 2012, we invited him to give a lecture here in UTM in between his tight schedule for the IEEE Distinguished Lecture Programs in Singapore and Japan. Today, we are very delighted to be able to meet him again in cyberspace. So without further ado, I would like to now pass the session to our Dean, Prof. Rafiq, to introduce Prof. Hussein. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Prof. Nick Rumzi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, everyone, to our 44th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome distinguished Professor Iqbal Hussein from North Carolina State University, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Iqbal Hussein is the director of the Freedom NSF Engineering Center and the ABB Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at North Carolina State University, Raleigh, North Carolina. He is also the director of the Advanced Transportation Energy Center at NC State. Prior to joining NC, he was at the University of Akron. He was a visiting professor at Oregon State University, Corvallis, in 2001. Dr. Hussein's expertise is in the areas of power electronics, electric machines, motor drives, and system controls. In the Freedom Center, his research is focused on power electronics integration into power systems and transportation electrification with wide band gap power electronic devices and permanent magnet and reluctance machine drives. The primary applications of his work are in the transportation, automotive, aerospace, and power industries. Dr. Hussein has also developed innovative graduate and undergraduate courses on electric and hybrid vehicles and published the textbook, Electric and Hybrid Vehicles, Design Fundamentals. Dr. Hussein received his PhD in electrical engineering from Texas A&M University in 1993. He received the 2006 SAE Vincent Bendix Automotive Electronics Engineering Award, the 2004 College of Engineering Outstanding Researcher Award, the year 2000 IEEE Third Millennium Medal, and the 1998 IEEE IAS Outstanding Young Member Award. He became an IEEE Fellow in 2009. He was the Distinguished Lecturer of IEEE Industry Application Society for 2012 to 2013. He is the past Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Electrification Magazine. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Iqbal Hussein from North Carolina State University, USA, to talk about high-speed electric machines and WBG power electronics for electric vehicles and transportation electrification. Distinguished Professor Iqbal Hussein, over to you. Thank you, Dean Rafiq. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, let me first uh, switch to the uh, presentation that I have for you today. Uh, and good morning, everyone in, in Malaysia. I know it's, it's morning over there, where it is uh, 9 p.m. in the evening uh, here in North Carolina. So, so I hope you can see uh, my presentation. I'm on the first slide here. Uh, my talk, as, as, professor, as Professor Rafiq has uh, mentioned, it is high-speed electric machines and wide-band gap power electronics for electric vehicles and transportation ele electrification. So um, let me see if I can. 
just to give you a perspective here, so we are in North Carolina in the northeastern part of uh, United States, uh, so many miles away. And uh, it's truly indeed like uh, I have been to a pleasure for me to talk to you all today. So I have been in Jor Bahru in 2012. So it was a very nice and pleasant visit and I met many of you were there. And over the years, I have been working on this high-speed electric machines and power electronics. Uh, with a lot more emphasis on renewable integration and transportation electrification. So just to give you a little bit background of where we are here in North Carolina and in North, uh, and North Carolina State University. So I'm part of this Freedom Engineering Research Center, which is a national science foundation, uh, which is the, the highest governmental body that supports research and education in the United States. Uh, it is a consortium of uh, four, five universities actually, but North Carolina State University is the lead on that. And the goal is to integrate uh, research uh, and education with industry collaboration. So bringing together the, the three um, uh, bodies that you see here, industry, education, and research to promote innovation opportunities and technologies and promote technologies. So the research areas uh, are in power electronics, electric transportation and renewable energy. We have 12 faculty, about more than 100 plus graduate students. And uh, over the past uh, 12 years, we have graduated collectively more than 200 PhD students and 250 master's students. Uh, with many innovations and patterns and then we have also been able to initiate at least or, or either our faculty or our students to have 10 startups in the renewable energy and transportation sector. So the research that I will be presenting today uh, is uh, not just my work. I work collaboratively with my colleagues. And as I mentioned, our focus area within the center in, in the power and energy uh, group is wide band gap power electronics with applications in electric transportation and renewable energy and connecting on the other end with power systems. So here you see the 12 faculty here, which covers the entire span of like uh, power devices like Jay Baliga, as you can see here, he's the inventor of the IGBT and then uh, other colleagues here who work on power electronics. My work spans both in the power electronics and electric machines. And then we have people here that work on power systems. So this truly collaborative environment gives us the opportunity to look at things from the systems perspective. Very important uh, to, to identify the gaps to really look where the opportunities are and then do research and innovation all the way down to the component level whether it's device or a power converter uh, to enable a really good system so that's where the electric transportation system comes in and i have uh, prepared this presentation here today to talk primarily on electric machines and then the power electronics with wide band gap and then uh, these aspects, what are the challenges, the innovations, the opportunities with traction machines? And then uh, also, what are the opportunities, challenges, uh, and the innovations with the electric traction inverter? And then how these wideband gap devices can also be used to build this electric vehicle charger, charging stations, which is essential uh, for the promotion of these uh, electric vehicles um, and the electric transportation in general. So many of these things will relate to other uh, electrified transformation as well, like, uh, um, let's see here. So I'm not sure like if the screen is moving, okay. All right. So. I Maybe it wasn't moving the slides, but now I suppose it is moving. Uh, so with the electric transportation, uh, the, the, let me talk a little bit about the trends overall in the transportation sector. So the main motivations are the, the diversification of energy. We cannot depend on one type of energy, the environmental concerns, and then uh, uh, an opportunity for economic growth new techniques, technologies, 
and innovations. So these are the market drivers for electric vehicles. So even like uh, 10 years back, electric vehicles didn't seem like you know, as hybrid vehicles were making more pa pathway into, into the market. But then Nissan Leaf came out with that 2011 Nissan Leaf, and then Tesla has been aggressively developing these power technologies. Now, uh, the electric vehicles are, is, is, is a reality. It's, it's here and it's growing. If, I, if you look at that, uh, if the chart that I have down there, so it took about five years to, to sell the first uh, million vehicles. And then, in, and then it only took like six months uh, with this upward trend to, the next, uh, to sell the next million. And in 2019, there has been 5 million electric vehicles sold worldwide, as you can see in the graph here. So along with the vehicles, there are like innovation opportunities in increased telematics, autonomous vehicles are coming. Uh, and, and there has been a change in even the societal perspective. Uh, as a society, we're moving towards like a, with shared driving, um, transportation is, is, is the mobility is offered as a service, right? So in many of these cases, like a vehicle, especially electric vehicle, uh, gives us more opportunities uh, with these new autonomous vehicles or mobility as a service. And then to support these infrastructure, like there has to be this charging station. So now 50 kilowatt charging stations are available from several vendors. Tesla is installing 135 kilowatt superchargers worldwide. And uh, there is more recent efforts in developing extreme fast chargers, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about today, uh, is uh, in excess of like 350 kilowatts so that we can get the ultimate goal is to go to um, having the driver or having the same experience as filling up a gasoline vehicle so that we can fill up uh, like the or fill up in the sense of like charging the batteries in five minutes or less 10 minutes or less i mean uh, as fast as we can so in terms of wide band gap semiconductors um uh there has been tremendous growth over the years, and then it has opened up opportunities for uh, uh, for a number of like new energy devices, and that's because these wide band gap devices, which are like silicon carbide and gallium nitride type devices, that are challenging the use of silicon uh, based devices because these wide band devices gives us. Uh, higher voltage, higher current capability with lower loss, higher frequency operation, higher temperature operation, which ultimately enables us to, to develop like higher efficient and higher power density uh, power converters. So that's what we are seeing with the wide band gap uh, power converters. Then with electric machines also, uh, there has been again, uh, new developments with not only with like the machine topologies and concept but with materials whether it is magnet material lamination material or winding technologies so that gives us the opportunity to come up with the um, machines that would give us the desired objectives for the next generation traction machines and what are these objectives so those would be the uh, higher power density because any in an electric vehicle, if you see whether it's a power converter or the electric machine or any other component, any mass that you save would translate to a few more miles that you can get on the same battery charge. So in essentially feel right? it increases the range. So that's why in all of these components, the, the design objective or what we desire the manufacturers would desire is higher power density, higher efficiency, higher efficiency, so, you know, minimize the losses and will give you maybe a few more miles uh, on the same battery charge. So in order to increase the higher power densities, the, the push has been like to go for higher speed operation. And then for performance, you want low torque ripple. The system has to be thermally stable as, then, as well as structural integrity has to be there. And then uh, the 
the the cost is another important factor so we always have to look uh, after the cost so lower dollars per kilowatt is another objective and in the electric vehicles uh, industry the most popular choice has been the interior power and magnet machines although like induction machine has been used in some cases but still the most popular choice is these ipm machines with rare earth power magnets but the, that's where some of the challenge also comes from because we these rare earth power and magnet materials are very expensive and they're available only a few pay, places in the world so the availability of these becomes a challenge. So then the, this gives the innovation opportunities for people to research on like novel magnets and lamination materials. And with the design tools and techniques, we can never underestimate that. The, the various finite element analysis tools and other simulation and analysis tools that can, you know, uh, enable that enables us for design optimization that would be very close to what you would get uh, from an experimental build. So that saves a lot of time and, and cost in the of development uh, efforts. So with these trends, the US Department of Energy formed these electric drive consortium, so of which we are a part, the Freedom Center uh, State is a part of these drive consortium that has industries and several other universities. But, uh, and they have given a task like over the next five years to develop a very high power density electric machine and a wide band gap inverter. So if you look at the trends like from 2010 and 2015 as shown in this table here in 2020, there has been improvements in the power density, uh, some reduction in cost and efficiency improvements, for example, from 90% as the whole, uh, traction drive system which includes just the power converter and the electric machine together from 90 to 94 uh, percent the matrix is a very few here because that ultimately will will uh, define the the other lower level matrix of the machine or the converter the matrix are the specific power per kilogram power density kilowatts per liter that's also um, uh, another important metric, and then cost is the other one. And then it's broken down into power electronics and uh, electric motors as well. So there has been improvements, but the goal of this consortium is to have a dramatic improvement. So what we are targeting is with, from the current status, which is about like uh, the powertrain cost of about 1800, which, uh, for, which is based on the 2016 Chevy Bolt, uh, a 150 kilowatt system uh, that translates to about $12 per kilowatt to go in five years, uh, um, bring that down by 50%. So that would be $6, six per kilowatt. And then for the, for the electric machine from about like the current is about like 10 kilowatts per liter, but a five fold improvement uh, to 50 kilowatts per liter. And for the inverter, it's again, we're targeting like 100 kilowatts per liter. So these are extremely challenging targets, but uh, this sets up us the, the research objectives and, and the consortium members uh, in, in co collaboration with the industries are working to see how close we can get to those targets. So let me go a little deeper into the what's happening on the electric machine side. So on the machine side, uh, the design trends has been to increase the DC link voltage and the machine speed. So machine speed, higher speeds uh, helps improve the power density. And if you go in a little deeper into the, the machine design side, increasing the number of pole, uh, going to higher speeds, they all would give us this higher power density, both in terms of power level, uh, as well as in terms of torque density, because high pole design increases the torque density, it will reduce the enter length, it will reduce the cost of the permanent magnets. Uh, and similarly, high speed design also will enable us to increase the power density. And in terms of winding, so the hairpin winding, instead of using like strands of conductors, this hairpin winding technology has become 
uh, very popular and GM first introduced this, the General Motors, I mean, in their vehicles where like uh, four bars or six bars are used in the conductor slots instead of stranded wires. And then again, the introduction of the wide band gap devices that will give a system level power density increase with better current regulation because you can operate them with higher PWM frequency. And because of the higher, uh, lower losses of these devices, you can improve the system efficiency. So that's, uh, you can see in terms of the, the electric machine design trends. So where are we? in terms of current uh, technologies. So if you look at like, so 50 kilowatts per liter is our, uh, is our target, but um, let me see if I can bring the pointer out. Mm. Okay, just a second, I'm trying to get the pointer. So, uh, it's okay, I'll continue like this. So, um, the uh, BMW i3 that ha has the highest power density of all the machines that are being in production uh, vehicles. So that's about 9.1 kilowatts per liter. And then the, the Accord, which has a uh, uh, slightly lower than that, but that's what the best that is available today. And what the industry has done over the years is given in some of these um, notes down below, let's, if you look at the Toyota Prius from 2010 to 2017, they have increased, uh, uh, they, they have gone from like um, 650 to 600 volt de-sealing voltage, uh, increase of not much by 50 volts, but then again, the speed, went from 13,000 to 17,000 RPM. And then uh, these Vs uh, that you see on the lower, lower right corner. So the IPM machines can be designed with single B, V or double V, but uh, Prius has gone into three magnets uh, to increase the power density. And I've also gone into wide band, uh, sorry, hairpin winding. So some of the things like, that are important in the machine design is the slot pole combination. So if you see 48 S8P, that means 48 slots and eight pole. So not all slot pole combination work. They all have some advantages or some disadvantages. So the industry has narrowed it down uh, through experience uh, and also through design analysis to some few slot pole combinations that are uh, more popular. For example, one of the things that you need to look into is the mode order. So that's the GCD, uh, greatest common denominator of that slot pole is eight. And that is related to the me mechanical resonance frequency. And the, the, the higher that mode order is, the resonance frequency will be higher. And then that reduces your uh, vibration and noise. So the NVH, noise, vibration, and harness is another important thing in all motors and vehicle designs. So one of the design goals would be to have at least eight uh, mode order or more. The slot per pole per phase, okay, the higher the number is, the tar but then uh, there are challenges. You cannot make it too high because the end winding lengths will uh, have challenges over there uh, and the losses would increase. So two is the number that has we have settled into. So 12 slot pole pair is uh, like another thing that we also lo look into the 12 that will give us like 12 mode order and then winding factor greater than 0.95. And then with eight poles and 18,000 RPM, the fundamental frequency comes out to be about 1200 Hertz. So the goal again is not to go too high on this fundamental frequency. 1200 is the highest that is in, in the production vehicles. And that's related to the PWM frequency. So to do a good current regulation, you need a bandwidth of at least an order of magnitude greater than that. So with IGBT devices, an order of magnitude more than 1200 Hertz is like uh, um, uh, 12 kilohertz. 
And that's about the limit that you can go with IGBT, silicon-based IGBT devices, because otherwise the switching losses would increase. And that's why none of the production uh, inverters switch at 20 kilohertz. It's, it's either 10 kilohertz or sometimes even less, but that's where the limitation on the fundamental frequency comes in. So these are some other examples of um, uh, the machines that have been that are being used. Uh, I'll just highlight the important points here. So in BMW, they use this 72 slot 12 pole that I mentioned previously gives this uh, mode order 12, which is really good, but still the fundamental frequency is around 1200 Hertz. So Nissan Leaf is 48 slot eight pole. The GM machines has this hairpin winding, but they are using a double V IPM. Instead of a single V, they use a double V. But the maximum speed is less than 10,000 RPM. And that's a limitation that comes uh, with the hairpin winding. Because the proximity and skin effects, the AC losses increases if this, the, the speed is too high. So that's why with hairpin winding, you cannot go to the very high speed mode. So that, that's another challenge there. So how do we, there are many choices and many options available. So we need tools, right? And then also as a professor, this is also part of what we do. We train those uh, students who go and work in these industries. And there's a real shortage of these electromagnetic machine design and power electronics engineers. So uh, I emphasize on these tools and the design methodologies, right? So for example, for this uh, electric machine design, you would start with some textbook equations uh, that will give you uh, uh, some numbers to start with, because with a finite element, you have something to, you, you need to have an initial design, right? Otherwise, what do you start with? And then with some experience, you, you uh, identify some of these numbers and select them, the mode order that you want. Do you want single or double layer? Uh, what are the constraints on trough ripple? Okay, so based on that, you come up with some, consideration of like whether it's an IPM, V, double V, or you want to go with the reluctance machine, and then go into the electromagnetic FEA. From that electromagnetic FEA, you do some optimization. Then you also need to evaluate in simultaneously the, 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 the structural integrity as well as the thermal stability. So this goes into this loop. So all of these things are so important and it needs a skilled engineer to, to iterate on all three aspects and not just one engineer. That's why we need this multidisciplinary collaboration between mechanical and electrical engineers uh, and then go through design iterations. And then at the same time, must not lose focus on the measurability and the materials that are available. So, okay, so let's say we have the tools and techniques what are the issues? We are trying to increase in speed. And, and then this, the goal is to go to more than 20,000 RPM from what the current trend uh, design is like 12,000 RPM. So what are the challenges? The structural integrity is of course one uh, important thing. If you look at the, uh, the if you look at this picture on the right, uh, then there are these bridges, right? So the, I circle those with red, the bridges. So they need to have minimum thickness, but that's where the maximum stresses will be. Plus uh, there would be core losses in these materials, right? So look for materials that will reduce the core losses because that translates directly both in terms of the thermal system that you have to design with high enough, you know, uh, thermal load extraction system. Plus uh, you cannot go to very higher, uh, you, you, you'll be limited in the amount of current that you'll be able to push to the windings. And then the, the, the stresses at those ribs, okay, they need to be structurally robust. So in terms of magnets, we are building these machines with foreign magnets. So you have to look into the magnet demagnetization, right? So that's one thing you look into because these rare earth foreign magnet materials, uh, they are, uh, they have, they cannot be operated more than like 150 degrees C. So there are strict limits. 
And then if we increase the frequency with um, silicon carbide type wideband gear devices, so the DVDT will have uh, will increase. That will have issues on motor uh, bearings, the insulations, and the turn-to-turn -turn shorts. So there are all these issues, that challenges that exist. So we cannot right away use a wideband gear silicon carbide type device and then go to 20 kilohertz or 30 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz because that will increase my DVDT. So that's why the importance of this um, system level evaluation comes in. Um, so yeah, so this is what I was talking about, the magnet demagnetization, the thermal limits, and the high DVDT issues. So we we need to look into these comprehensive electromagnetic structural and thermal optimizations for a good design. So how do you how do you check? So this is a little bit details of engineering here, but uh, just uh, I'll briefly touch on that. How do you check the demagnetization? Basically, what you do like these machines we control with uh, those who are familiar with the. Uh, machine electric machine modeling and controls you know that like we convert from the abc three-phase system into a dq system and then in your controller you have a direct axis and a quadrature axis right so direct axis is the magnet axis so there will be current id in that which would control the flux and uh, and then iq is what is uh, through the modeling and controls is the iq component is one that will produce torque so ID current, a negative ID current is used in the field weakening mode to extend uh, the speed range of the machine. So the demagnetizations are checked by uh, putting like the peak current all along the D axis. So that's the, the most uh, you know, uh, current that can be pushed against the magnets. And then look whether the magnets have reached the fluxes have reached the new point of these uh, BH characteristics of the magnets. So the BH characteristics basically, if you if you if if the the flux density goes below that knee point, the permanent magnets will get permanently demagnetized, and then even if you remove the current from there, uh, then it will not produce it will not provide the flux to produce the torque that you need, right? So if you take the magnet cross section, the the design technique is to check uh, 0.1 millimeter inside of that magnet with that red dotted line, and then make sure that there is less than one percent area where the flux is below. Uh, is not below knee point. And that this diagram on the bottom right shows you that with this particular design, it's because uh, that criteria has been met. So this is how you check the demagnetization of magnets. And this is one critical thing that needs to be evaluated during the design stage. Now, another, what is the way to uh, minimize cost? The expensive piece in the electric machines, uh, in these traction electric machines, is the magnets, uh, because the rare arts are very expensive. And then to improve the, the thermal sensitivity or temperature capability of these um, magnets, we use the dysprosium, the dye. So the dye is even like uh, six times more than the neodymium, which is the rare earth magnet with which these materials are made. So if we can reduce uh, the, the amount of dye uh, in a magnet piece, that will help reduce the cost. If we can completely eliminate some of these rare arts through novel magnets, then that will reduce the cost. So the GBDP magnets, this is now that are more and more used, grain boundary diffusion process magnet, is like you selectively, say if this is a magnet cross section shown over here in this table, you selectively uh, add more dysprosium in the corners, but less in the edges. If you look at the BH curve, you see like the adding of these, uh, uh, these are actually called the heavy rare art, the dysprosium and the terbiums. So if you add it, it improves the uh, the knee point, and that helps with the uh, the demagnetization effect. So 
and it has been like from the peer simulation, you can see the demagnetization effects are, are more in the edges or in the corners, right? So we can selectively put the dysprosia in the edges of the magnets, but not use so much in the middle. So that's another way to reduce the cost. And that's how these GBDP magnets have evolved and now being widely used in these traction electric machines. So you see, it's not like the, the machine design, uh, the, the fundamentals are still the same, but the research has gone into looking for new type of windings, new type of magnets, material developments, uh, and then uh, uh, optimization through finite element analysis to do sh pole shaping, uh, single B, double B. So that's where we look for innovations in the, in the electric machine. So I already mentioned about this uh, structural integrity. Uh, this has to be done to, uh, through finite element analysis. I just show an example using ANSYS tool here. And you, you check the stress at, uh, through at the maximum speed. What is the, what is the, you know, the stress level in megapascals uh, at your ribs I showed earlier, and then whether they're below the yield strength or not. So that's how you can check the structural integrity uh, of the lamination materials. Similarly, you have to do the thermal also. Uh, the common techniques that are used are either you can use water jacket cooling or oil spray or slot water jacket. But again, with the flow rate uh, from your thermal system and the uh, you have to check the hottest spots and what are the temperatures that can be maintained in the in the uh, fully loaded condition of the machine. And this thermal analysis need to be done for the, the power converters as well. So I probably need to go a little more quickly. Um, uh, I will go some of these uh, slides uh, quickly just touch up on the important points. So the main issue is the, the, the DVDT. If you break up the machine into these three parts, there's cable, there's motor, and then there's this invisible uh, from the neutral point to the ground, like these capacitors, the parasitic ones. So the, the bearing currents are due to these slopes of the voltages that you sh show on the right are coming from the common mode voltage. So these capacitances and the rate of change of that voltage that is applied is what causes the bearing current. So that's one issue. With higher switching frequency, the bearing currents will increase. Okay. Uh, the other issue is the insulation. If you take develop the high frequency model of the machine, uh, again, because of the higher switching frequency, the the voltage at the inverter, as you can see on the right, is um, is nice square waveforms with PWMs. But due to the cables, uh, there will be these spikes that you see on the right. So the the with silicon, the rise time is even faster, the rise and fall time. So that will cause these spikes, and that will cause may cause insulation damage. So the, the windings have certain grades of like insulation levels. And if, if it switches too fast, then they will cause these uh, insulation damage, particularly like in the first turn. And the other one is there like there can be like turn to turn short. So because in between the first turn and the last turn, there will always be some air pockets, okay? And then these air pockets are uh, you know, the zones where there will be partial discharge or corona. And that the, 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 it comes from those, uh, again, the applied voltages and the rate of change of voltages. So, so there will be uh, partial discharge going on in there. So these are the issues that we have to look uh, into from machine design side. As we develop the wide band gap inverters, we cannot just you know build an inverter with high switching frequency that will give me high efficiency, and and then be able to use that. So um, I'll just quickly touch on some of the the machines the designs that we are working on. So this is one of them, but as you can see here, this table shows us that. Uh, 
uh, through some fractional slot design or integer slot design uh, with some innovations in the, the windings, we are able to go very close to that uh, 50 kilowatt per liter. So these two examples shows you 44.9 kilowatts per liter and then 47 kilowatts per liter. And with fractional slot concentrated winds, uh, uh, with lower torque ripple and going into higher speed. So that's one way of increasing that. So another one is like with two minutes, uh, just if you look at the diagram there, there is a difference in, in the end, uh, theta one and theta two. And these are selectively designed so that you can minimize the torque ripple, which is another issue that exists in these machines. So. That's another innovation. Another one uh, is asymmetric bar winding. Remember with the hairpin windings, now all the designs that, that are used use like the same cross-sectional area for these bars, the six bars are shown here, but uh, the conductor that close to the slot opening, they uh, induce more AC losses. So shown that like uh, through design and analysis, like if you if you reduce the height of these conductors that are closer to the slot, the the AC resistance is proportional to that height. Then the the AC losses or high frequency losses will get reduced. So with that, from 10,000 RPM, we can go um, because of the loss large saving, especially in the efficiency map. If you look at the bottom right we can go to 15000 16000 rpm and then the manufacturing has to be looked into because if you look at the welding end, end of these wire hairpins in the middle picture here so that shows how it can actually be manufactured with the same cross sectional area across that welding cross section okay so that's about the machine let me talk a little bit about the the inverter design also uh, what we can do with silicon carbide type inverters. So the silicon carbide devices, if you look at the powertrain, they can be used in any one of them, like the powertrain inverter. If there is a boosted DC-DC boost, some powertrains have this inverter, like Toyota has that, uh, then that those can be used over there or in the charger or in the DC-DC converter as well. So, um, the more pop, depending on the DC link voltage, uh, if it is volts, then you'd probably use 750 volt silicon carbide devices. If it's 800 volt, then you use, use 500 volt devices. And then this chart shows you uh, like the benefits uh, using silicon carbide devices with a 500 volt system, or in the bottom one is like 800 volt system and uh, against different drive cycles. So we use these different drive cycles, Artemis or highway drive cycle or urban drive cycle for different driving scenarios. And then um, the, the efficiency improvements that we can have. And uh, as, as shown over here, the higher bus voltage gives us more percentage increases um, in efficiency. So, there is system level performance to be gained with higher voltage. We have seen that benefits on the machine design side, but even at the system level side also in terms of, you know, uh, the conductor sizes, um, uh, the cables that have to be used uh, because they would carry less current. So there are several system level advantage and there are some advantages from the battery side also. The higher voltages benefits from that. So the traction inverters, uh, here on the right, I just showed two pictures here because that's how the, the electric vehicle design uh, is being done. This is known as the skateboard chassis. So the batteries, uh, the Audi e-tron and the Tesla Model S are shown over here. And uh, the batteries are on the bed. Uh, and then the power converters, uh, uh, and the electric machines are all on the skateboard chassis. And the dual motor is becoming more popular. So that's what is that this uh, Tesla and Audi, they're also going in. And the inverter requirement is in the range of like 90 to 350 kilowatts, okay? Uh, not just the inverter, inverter and motor together. 
and then they can be in single dual or hub drives. So why silicon carbide? Because uh, the Tesla is the first industry to, to use uh, silicon carbide inverter, but uh, they have not gone higher with switching frequency. They're still switching at the lower frequency, but uh, because of, they are mainly using it for the efficiency gain, because that helps reduce some of the battery cells. Uh, and then that helps save cost in the battery. But uh, with the same switching frequency, lower 10 kilohertz or so, they didn't have to address any of the EMI issues. The EMI challenges didn't come. So that, that's how it's, it's going. Um, with silicon carbide, you can have the efficiency advantages, uh, uh, lower system level cost, um, reliability, May, so the issues to be solved is like the cost is still high. The reliability, the short circuit uh, protection capability is not so good with these silicon carbide devices. The EMI issues are there. So those are the issues that need to be solved. And uh, the EMI, the rise time that I showed you earlier, is in the commutation loop inductance. So one of the biggest uh, uh, the equation is like LDIDT, so that during the turnoff time, so with this graph here, uh, if you can reduce, well, we already have a very short uh, turnoff time. So the only way we can improve it is, is improving on this commutation loop inductance. So the design goal is to like get that below 10 nano Henry so that the EMI issues can be managed uh, with this. And then reducing the total thermal resistance. So here show some examples of like Danfoss uses these uh, uh, heat sinks. Basically, the thing is like you must have uniform heat extraction all across the devices. It's not like uh, you would so that all of the devices in the power converter get the same amount of uh, coolant. Uh, and then the same amount of heat extraction is possible. So that's where these thermal system designs are evolving. So short circuit protection, that's another critical thing that needs to be checked, okay, for the power devices. So the devices give you this DSET protection, right? But DSET doesn't work, uh, is, is still too slow for the automotive applications. If there is a short in the inverter, uh, that needs to be isolated very quickly, okay? So because of the very low short circuit capability uh, of the silicon carbide devices, there are many challenges, and I show this chart. Uh, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. But this is another area that needs to be worked on. Uh, and people are researching on that, like how to provide this short circuit protection. And the main thing comes from like the two, two top uh, uh, blocks I have of text, the extremely high DVDT of silicon carbide device, which has gone up from two to four, six kV microsecond to about 20 to six kilovolts per microsecond. And the problem is exacerbated because like the short circuit capability of silicon IGBTs is 10 microseconds, and then silicon carbide MOSFET is one to three microseconds. So the automotive industry, like with 10 microseconds, that gives them enough time to detect that and take the protection measures. But with silicon carbide, one to three microseconds is not uh, enough to give that protection. So uh, some, examples of designs that we, we have been working on. So one of the things is this uh, PCB-based bus bar instead of using laminated bus bar. So the PCB-based bus bar, again, uh, gives us lots of design opportunities in terms of minimizing the loop inductance we talked about, placing ceramic caps right at the terminals of the devices uh, so that these uh, DVDTs can be addressed. So this is one way we have worked in, in designing our inverter. Then um, this is the, the low profile shunt based current sensing. Instead of using hall sensors, using shunt sensors with the signal chain processing through the, the, the electronics. So that's uh, another 
you know, uh, design innovation. Then analysis, right, with permutation loop inductance. So ANSYS Q3D modeling, where you can, the, the PCB-based bus bar, uh, as well as the model loop inductance, they all can be modeled in this uh, ANSYS tool. And then you can calculate through design and simulation analysis, what is the loop inductance if it's not good. So two things you look into, uh, if I go to the next slide, whether the uh, um, whether the current distribution is uniform or not, and what is the loop inductance. So you can get all of this information um, from these analysis. So here, um, uh, as you can see, uh, like the middle one, it has not uniform current uh, distribution. Even though the loop inductance is a little bit slower, uh, smaller, but the current distribution is not good, which means it will affect the thermals. But if you have a uniform current distribution, then the thermals will be better. So that's why we, we opted to use this third uh, type of uh, you know layout. So with that, we developed these 135 kilowatt uh, silicon carbide based traction inverter, which gave us a power density of um, about 20 kilowatts per liter. So this is about two years old uh, with an efficiency of 99%. But again, see our target is to get to 100 kilowatts per liter, right? So we have to do, and then there has been design since then that, that at least goes up to like 50 kilowatts per liter, but it's nowhere near that 100 kilowatt per liter target that we have. So uh, I'm near the end. I just wanna mention a little few things about the, the charging station. So the fast chargers, okay, uh, if you look at the traditional, the ones that are being installed, 50 kilowatt type fast chargers, so they are all connected to the 480 volt bus. And, and then whether you have an active front end or a diode front end, uh, they're all similar, more or less similarly trans, uh, structured. With active front end, the, 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 the goal is like it will enable like future vehicle to grid bi-directional powerful capability so that vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, both can be accommodated. So a charging station would look like uh, typically uh, there would be some energy storages, some PV panels, and then several charging ports. And the benefits would be much more if we move from this 40, 80 volt bus to a medium voltage grid. And we can do that with a solid state transformer. And this solid state transformer can be made of silicon carbide devices. So this is how we have a project of designing an extreme fast charger, because going to the medium voltage, this, this, this shows you that like, uh, the middle picture is that of a 50 kilowatt ABB Terra charger, but you don't only not only need that charger, but you need the service transformer also. But if you connect directly to the medium voltage, it will reduce the size with silicon carbide devices that we have built to just that bottom piece over there. So it's a tremendous uh, reduction in size uh, and or increase in power density. So that's that's another project that we are working on like with our silicon carbide technology that like uh, there will be this medium voltage SST and then there will be a DC distribution bus in the middle and then with the capability of charging different vehicles with different voltage ratings some of them could be 800 volts some of them could be 400 volts or even 200 volts so so that's one of the other things that we are working on so uh, that brings to the end of my presentation here. Sorry, I took a little few more minutes here, but uh, I will stop sharing. And then like, if there are questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer that. Thank you very much, Prof. Hussein, for a very informative and interesting talk. Uh, for those of you who has any question to ask, you can post the question to our Facebook uh, Facebook web, uh, page. Um, maybe while waiting for the question, I can can I ask you a question or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. So you you talk about mainly uh, about the uh, high speed uh, machine. Mm -hmm. um, is there any future for the in wheel motor where you, you know you require a uh, um, low speed high torque? Yeah, of course there is. So that's another uh, another path for design innovation. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and then like uh, so the the type of motor technology that will work best over there because of the form factor is the actual flux machines. So with actual flux machines, you can also get very, very high power density. Mm -hmm. And the in-wheel motors will be like drag drive. Uh, and then more recently, there is a, like a company called the, um, Yasa. They came up with it. Yeah. They, they have a, a very, you know, an actual phased uh, motor, very much suitable for uh, either in-wheel so they, I think, I believe there is a, there is room and there is, you know. Mm -hmm. But the trend is to go for the uh, high, high speed machine, right? At yeah, moment, but yeah. I, would, I should add to that, like, so machine designers, machines people would like to go to very high speeds because it, it reduces the, the size. But yeah. the mechanical engineers will not be very so happy because the gear <laughs> also has to be proportional mm -hmm. to the size, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there is a limit. I mean, we can say that we can go to 20,000 RPM or so, but the, the gears also has to be, the gear ratio increases. So it, it, it really looks, needs to be looked into from, from the system level. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, if you have any question, please uh, post your question to the, uh, to the, uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, Facebook uh, page. Um, another thing, uh, Prof. Iqbal, mm -hmm. you know, in Malaysia, the acceptance of electric vehicle is very, very, very poor mm. uh, um, compared to the other countries, for example, compared to the US. So what do you think, you know, we, we, we should do or you have done in order to, uh, you know, increase the uh, um, acceptance of this uh, usage of this electric vehicle? Yeah. I mean, actually, U.S. is not leading in this as well. So the 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 country that is promoting really heavily is China. So the largest number of electric vehicles, and even like uh, you know the components that are you know shipped from U.S., like the power devices and all that, mm -hmm. they are going uh, mostly to China because of the large growth. So. Uh, in US, it's uh, it, it is actually maybe even less than Europe also because like after the one thing that promoted the development of the electric vehicles is like the the scandal with the Volkswagen diesels, right? So that's when many European companies just started. Um, full line of electric vehicles and that has promoted a lot of sales in Europe and and US it's there but it has to be a combination of um, of uh, policies and incentives mm -hmm. uh, from the government level and then that but that alone is not sustainable right so the innovations uh is also another way so that if it is cost compared there is in the us i would still say that like there is a niche market there is a people who wants to buy these but the numbers has been growing uh, quite significantly uh, so the cost reduction is is the other thing right at least if it is comparable and that's what like the tesla model 3 has done and is it comparable how, now in the us i mean the, in terms of the cost like it's Lindsay still not as uh, no, not not. It's it's much lower. It is, I would say, maybe in an affordable range, but that still is like with uh, tax incentives that one would get from the government, like uh, when you buy mm -hmm. the, the Tesla Model Three. But like the the numbers have increased significantly. Yeah. All right, and then like so some so the the, the large companies also. Uh, has to work out. So there is another big market that's, that is growing in these delivery vans. So some companies Ford uh, in conjunction with Rivian has uh, partnered with Amazon 
to, to develop this electric vehicle delivery band. So that's another big opportunity there because it really does a lot of saving with the dry, kind of drive cycle this delivery vans have. Yeah. So, so it is like, I think what needs to be looked into is what will work, right? What type of mar market would be attractive, mm -hmm. let's say in, in, in each country and then All right. targeting mm -hmm. towards that. Okay, we have a, a question here, I think, um, from Mr. Azrai. Is silicon carbide inverter beneficial in some way for low speed machines? Example, actual flux, uh, the driving decision being cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so is it? Can you yeah, see the um, No, I, 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 yeah, I can see the question. Yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, it will definitely be because like the, the inverter will still be switching. I mean, the machine speed can be lower but the inverter switching frequency will be higher, right? So mm -hmm. then it it will have the similar efficiency advantages yeah. in terms of the inverter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is there any other question? Um, waiting for the question, but... Um, so I think it's over one hour now. I think, <laughs> I think we, we, we can stop now if there's no other question. And um, I would like very much to, to can thank you again for this very informative and very interesting talk on these um, high-speed machines and white band gap uh, um, applications. Um, on behalf, uh, I think uh, is uh, Prof Rafik is online or? He's not around yet. He's not around yet because I think he has another meeting to attend. Okay. Okay. So yeah, normally he will be. He will give a closing remarks for for the talk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if he's not around, then I would like just like to thank you very much on behalf of UTM for your uh, willingness to give uh, this very valuable talk to us uh, and spare your time uh, with us. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity, and hopefully, it was uh, some use to you. Oh. All right. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And and bye. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.